verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Chapter three. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you, bind them around your neck, Write them, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father, the son he delights in. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Chapter 10, verse 17. Whoever heeds discipline shows the way of life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Chapter 14, verse 15. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. The word of the Lord. Well, thanks, Eric, and thanks, Faye, for that lovely introduction as we're thinking about our topical series now from the book of Proverbs. So let me ask you again, who is the wisest person you know? Who is the wise... I know you're saying me, but like, who, who, who is the wisest person you know? Look, as someone who's done eight years of full-time university study, I often think of an answer to that question based in academic terms. I remember one of my curate's wives had a doctorate from Oxford, and I thought, hmm, that was pretty impressive. Although I knew a missionary who had two doctorates. I mean, who has two doctorates? But maybe wise isn't just intellectual knowledge. I think of a CEO friend of mine who not only effectively grew his company and knew how to make great leadership decisions, but every week, he told me, he used to go and sit on the factory floor, literally, beside his workers to encourage them. He was wise not just in intellectual terms, he was emotionally intelligent as well. But what about wisdom in terms of being a godly Christian? I think of a friend of mine who is now in his late 70s and he's still running multiple prayer training sessions, multiple preaching training sessions in order to raise up generation after generation of new clergy and leaders for the church. Who is the wisest person you know? And as we begin our topical series from the book of Proverbs, it's all about how to be wise not just intellectually wise, it does include that, and not just emotionally wise, but it does include that, but being wise before God. Wise in how we think, wise in how we feel, wise in how we act before the living God. And we will seek to apply wisdom to various areas of our life over this sermon series. I'm calling today, if you like, core wisdom, but then we'll talk about how to be wise at work and then wise in generosity and wise with science and wise with sexuality and wise with humility and wise with our friendships and wise with our words. But if you read my little blurb on the handout, not this one, the, the one we put out last week, Proverbs is different to most other books in the Bible. And the wise person 
will read the book of Proverbs according to its literature style, according to its genre. See, Proverbs is not like the book of Colossians. It was a letter that told us what to believe and therefore how to live. There's a big fly. It was doing that to me. It buzzes me. It's not very wise. <laughs> but but uh, Proverbs is not like a letter in the New Testament, like the book of Colossians. It's not like a gospel, like Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, telling us of the life and the sayings of Jesus. It's not a history book like 1 and 2 Samuel telling us about the rise and fall of kings. Proverbs is known literally as wisdom literature. And Proverbs is mostly pithy sayings that we are meant to go away and think about. Like we heard from Proverbs 12, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. <laughs> and lots of them are like that, just little phrases like that. And we're not meant to just read it and then say, how do I apply that today? No, rather we're meant to read it and then we're to think about the saying and then we're meant to repeat the saying in our mind and then we're meant to go for a walk and to mull over the phrase and then we're meant to stick it on our fridge and, and remember it each day for a week and we're meant to talk to our friends about the saying over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. And then we think, how do we live this, do you see? Proverbs is a different style. We're meant to think about, we're meant to ponder these phrases. Well, this collection of Proverbs is mostly a collection of Solomon's sayings, but there are also Proverbs from a number of other people that have been collated into what we now have as the book of Proverbs. Mostly, like I said, they're pithy sayings, but, but sometimes they're extended introductions like we have in chapter 1. And sometimes there are broader pieces of advice through the book as well. But today, core wisdom, as Faye has on her bookmark, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord and accepting correction. When I was a music teacher many years ago, one of the challenges was gaining respect from the students. You know, I, I realised even way back then that respect was earned, not just given. Now, you hoped that with the status of being a teacher, somehow the kids would hang on your every word. It did not work like that, let me tell you. And with the myriad bits of wisdom in the book of Proverbs, there is one core idea, and we heard it in 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Or in chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And God expects our respect. Well, in fact, more than respect, the Proverbs uses this word fear. Now, a little aside on the use of this word fear. Fear here does not mean terror or being frightened by God. I mean, it's true that God could, like, unmake us in a second. And if we believe any of the stories of the Bible, he is an absolutely awesome God. But the word fear, it has its sense in uh, reverent awe. Reverent awe, and our response is meant to be in submissive faith. I mean, this is an encounter with the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that is the covenant God of Israel, the redeeming God who saves his people, and we are to respond with what he reveals about himself. Like we heard in chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. But again, let me pause there for just a minute and ask you a broader question, and that is, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? Because wisdom beginning with the fear of the Lord begs the question about whether we believe in God in the first place or not. I mean, if someone said to you over morning tea in just a minute, why do you believe in God? What would your answer be? Here are some of my answers, okay? Number one, there must be someone behind the existence of the known universe. That is, there must be, as they say in philosophical terms, an uncaused cause. There must be someone 
who had to start it. Take, for instance, all the things in this room, in this church building. All of them were made by something outside of themselves. The organ was made by someone else, somewhere else. The Bibles were made somewhere else. The chairs were made by someone else. You were made somewhere else. Together, all of these things in this room were made by something outside of this room. Now, imagine all the things in the universe, you know, all the planets, all the stars, all the black holes, all the galaxies, all of it. Logically, something outside of the universe must have made it, must have caused it to begin, oh, whether by Big Bang or some other way, I'm not particularly fast, but there must be a God behind the existence of this universe. It's reason one. Here's reason two why I believe in God. There must be someone behind the order of this universe. You know, the way the earth goes around the sun, tilted just right on its axis. But not just big things like that, little tiny things as well. You know, I love doing biology at school and realising that a single cell in our body is made up of this like myriad of things. You know, it's not just a nucleus, there, there's mitochondria and cilia and microtubules, if I can remember my biology from year 12. And, and then things like mitochondria by themselves are made up of like DNA and ribosomes. And DNA is made up of like three billion bases and, and so on. And yet all these tiny, tiny, tiny bits of things work together so that a single cell functions in your body. And then all those other single cells function so that this whole body can finally work. I cannot, I cannot believe that the immense complexity of the human body, let alone the universe, is simply a fluke. The design tells me that there must be a God behind it. Reason number three. There must be someone behind the beauty of the universe. Like Romans says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understand from what has been made. You know, when I see the beauty of the stars or the beauty of a sunset over black rock or, or the beauty of a piece of art, or the beauty of one of our cat's movements as it runs down the corridor, or when I hear a beautiful piece of music, I think, where did that beauty come from? Why is there such a thing as beauty? I know, because there must be a God. Number four, but of course, there is a much more direct piece of evidence for God, uh, that is, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, because Jesus Christ came to earth, and in his words and actions, he demonstrates that there is a God. In fact, he demonstrates that he is God, because God has not just left us to philosophize about his existence. He has come down and revealed himself to us through the history of the scriptures, through creation and the people of Israel and the coming of the law and the prophets and then finally through the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, in his incarnation and his life and his death and his resurrection and ascension and the promise of a new creation one day. God revealing the truth about himself to us. Worth believing in. So, if we do believe in an all-powerful and infinite God, then the fear of the Lord is the right beginning of wisdom. The wise person believes in and responds to God. When I taught saxophone to kids at school many years ago, there was a purpose to teaching saxophone. It wasn't just so the student had an intellectual knowledge of playing the instrument. You know, you, you taught them so that they would be able to play without squeaking and annoying their parents. 
You, you taught so that they played the right notes and so they made a nice melody and not an ugly sound. You, you taught them so that they played in time and so that they could play in a band. And in the end, you taught them that one day they might give pleasure to others through the beauty of music. There, there was purpose to the teaching. And there is purpose to wisdom listed there in verses 2 to 5 of chapter 1. It is so that we might understand. That is, wisdom does use our intellect. It does engage gauge our brains. Please notice that Christianity is not an unthinking, like, blind faith religion. It's meant to engage our brains. We are meant to think. And that understanding then leads to insight so that we can see rightly. And that insight leads to right behaviour, to prudent behaviour. And that behaviour leads to doing what is right and just and fair. So that we in the church and we in our society might have like justice tempered with mercy. And that wisdom is meant to lead us to maturity. So wisdom in Proverbs is often for the young, but it's also for anyone who wants to be wise. And we pay attention to wise sayings so that we might understand and learn and see and change and thus do what is right. There is a purpose to wisdom. It's not just for academic knowledge, it is for that, but it's also that we might live rightly before God and thus in turn bring good to this world that we live in. Like we saw actually in the book of Colossians, the amazing understanding of all that Christ is and said and did was meant to change us both personally and at home and even at work and actually in society as well. Wisdom has a purpose. Now, as you teach saxophone, you don't just get the student to play the piece of music. There is a whole method to teaching saxophone as well. You teach scales and arpeggios so that your fingers glide over the piece, pieces, phrases and, and, and sounds easier and quicker. You practice holding long notes. I often, I often practiced holding notes as long as I could. I could get up to about a minute because you needed to do that to try and get a smooth and even pitch and sound. And you simply have to practice hours a day so that you have stamina in your lips and in your cheeks and in your fingers to be able to get through the pieces so that you can play the concert in the end. And you have to play with other people so that you can match their pitch and their tempo and their bounce and their volume and their dynamics. That is, there is a method to teaching. And likewise, there is a method to wisdom, to being wise. You see that in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The wise listen. The wise listen. Wise people know how to listen. You know, I like that saying, we've got two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as much as you speak. You cannot be wise without being willing to listen. And that listening will mean we add to our learning. And that learning will lead to discernment and so guidance for life, which in turn will lead to true understanding. Or chapter 3 began, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. That is, in terms of method, we need reminders so that we do not forget the teaching. You know, you don't just play a piece of music once and go and perform it. No, most of us need to go over and over it again so that we get it right, so that we remember it. It's the same thing with learning wisdom about God. Actually, you know, I think it's a strength of the liturgy of the Anglican Church that sometimes we go over the core things like the commandments or like the creeds time and time again so we do not forget the teaching. In fact, Proverbs 3.3 3 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That is, do whatever it takes to remember love and faithfulness. 
Actually, it reminds me of Deuteronomy 6, where the people are literally to tie physical reminders of the commandments on their person, just as some Orthodox Jewish people still do today. You could do something like that, actually. Here's an application. Why not write out the phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and stick it on your fridge this week. And every time you go and get something out of your fridge, you go, oh, that's right, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of it. Or write it on a piece of paper and stick it in your pocket. And every time you go to get out your phone or you get, get, get to go out your keys, there it is again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or you could make a screensaver with it on it, or you could put it on a background of your phone. And wisdom's method is also that we need to accept discipline and correction. Did you notice that in 3.11? Do not despise the Lord's discipline. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Or there in 10.17, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life. And 12.1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Not much point in teaching a kid saxophone if they won't accept any correction. And despite what I said about, I keep saying, about needing to be encouragers and needing to be praisers, sometimes a correction needs to be given and we need to be willing to hear it. That might be about something we didn't quite believe rightly. It might be about something we said wrongly. It might be about something we failed to do might be about how we discern or care for others. It might be about how we behave in certain situations. But the wise person is willing to hear and take a correction and then act on it. And lastly today, there are benefits to wisdom. Like I said, there are benefits to being able to play the saxophone. I I actually love being able to play for other people. I, I love being able to give other people a sense of joy at the beauty of music because I'm playing my saxophone. That's a great privilege to be able to do that. And the benefits of wisdom are many and listed mostly in chapter three. Teaching your wisdom, look at verse three, chapter three, verse two. Wisdom will prolong your life. Now, remember these are proverbs. They may not be true in every circumstance, but they are generally true in most circumstances. A wise person will live long because because they won't do stupid things. Again, a wise person will have peace and prosperity because you'll live well with others around you and you'll work well with other people and at your workplace. And so you'll have a a good name and you'll live well because he will make your paths straight and there will be a sense of wholeness. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Uh, We know caring for our health involves wisdom and in the end our wisdom will bring benefits to others. Now if you're looking at the text, the sense of chapter 3 verses 9 and 10, honour the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. It is not actually so much so that we might be wealthy in and of ourselves, but with our excess of grain and excess of wine, we might in turn be able to be a blessing for others. Uh, More of that when we get to our sermon on generosity and greed. But as I said, wisdom is not just for intellectual knowledge. There are actually real benefits. Here are some of them. Long life, peace, a good name, straight paths, wholeness, the ability to be a blessing for others. Learning God's wisdom is not just about our obedience to God. It's not just so that we might not be judged by God. Rather, God has so set up his universe that we get benefits from living under his wisdom. I hope you know that. God wants for our good and not for our bad. Living under his wisdom is for our good, not for our evil. Well, at the end of this sermon, my encouragement 
is to take just one of these sayings from these chapters and reflect on it, mull over it, go for a walk and remember it, and then think, how this week will I respond to our awesome God? Amen.